So you're there in Psalm 19, Psalm 19, and I want to preach a sermon entitled, Have They Not Heard? Have They Not Heard? Okay, and this is a, a, a principle or I guess a question that a lot of unbelievers have when it comes to um, people that I've talked to recently, actually just family members, and, uh, and I think of my grandpa when I was trying to give him the gospel, one of the big things with him was just really struggling with the fact of like, all these different religions, all these different places around the world, and the idea of uh, you know them not growing up with the Bible or not growing up with uh, Christianity or you know that that type of uh, thought process. And uh, this passage always comes to mind when I think of that. Okay, and then Psalm 19 here, I'm going to show you that actually a portion of this is quoted in Romans chapter 10. Okay. So in Psalm 19, in our memory verse is that first verse there, but it says in verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Okay, so he's talking about, you know, the heavens and the firmament, right? If you remember, the, the sun, moon, and stars are in the firmament of the, the heavens. So there's three heavens, right? You have the heaven where the birds fly, and that's called a firmament. And then you have the firmament where... Uh, you have what we would call outer space, um, and that's where the sun, moon, and stars are at. And then you have the third heaven, which is what Paul talked about, a man being caught up to the third heaven, which is paradise, right? That's where God's throne's at. That's the heaven where it says heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool. That's what that's talking about. But notice right here in verse 3, it says, There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the earth, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The, te the statutes of the Lord are right, right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So this is a great passage, obviously, talking about the Word of God. But what he starts off with here in this psalm is talking about the sun, moon, and stars, okay? And the whole principle is what he's getting across here is that everybody sees that, right? Like, there's not a place on the earth where the sun's not touching at some point. And I know you're like, well, Alaska, there's points, there's days where the sun's not there, right? It's just darkness. Yeah, but the sun is going to hit there eventually, right? Meaning that it's not that the sun never hits there, Okay. But the whole point is, is that, you know, the sun, you know, at nighttime here, it's sunny over there. So they're seeing the sun. Every part of the earth sees the sun. Every part of the earth sees the stars. Every part of the earth is going to see the moon. And, and it's also something that you don't need. There's no language barrier there. Does that make sense? Uh, when you think of astronomy or if you just think of mathematics, right? Mathematics is what they call the universal language, Right? You know, you're dealing with numbers, math, you know, just it's black and white. And it's something that um, you may pronounce it differently as you're saying the mathematical equation. But the mathematical equation, it has nothing to do with language, okay? It's its own universal language, if you will. And the point he's getting across here, if you notice in verse 3, it says, There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard, okay? And what I believe this passage is talking about is the Word of God is not bound by anything. It basically, the Word of God is as if you're looking at mathematics, meaning that it's, it's a universal language that can be in any language, and that everybody sees it, okay? This isn't something that's hidden in the corner. The sun, you know, just as much as the sun is, you know, as the earth is rotating and the, the sun obviously is, uh, you know, going around the earth in our perspective, right? And the fact that uh, it's in its circuit, right? then that's the same thing that applies with the Word of God, meaning that the Word of God is shining on the whole earth, okay? And, you know, these people that are like, well, you need to know the Greek and Hebrew. That's not what the Bible teaches. The day of Pentecost will, will throw that in your face, but how about this right here? And you say, well, how do you know that that right there, when it's talking about the, the heavens declare the glory of God, and how do you know that he's likening that unto his word? Well, go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 is going to actually quote that verse in verse 4 there where it says their line has gone out through the, all the earth and the, their words to the end of the world. Okay, We're going to see where that's quoted and what's that 
that's referring to in Romans chapter 10. So, now, I want to put a preface here because I do not believe that someone's going to get saved by looking up at the sun, moon, and stars, okay? You know, there's people out there that believe that. are like, you can look up into the heavens and get the gospel and get saved by looking up in the heavens. I don't believe that. I believe he's using that to show you the universal aspect of salvation, the gospel, and the word of God, okay? And that it's, it's worldwide. It's not something that's just for one location and one culture and, and all that. And the reason I'm preaching this is because a lot of people struggle with this. They'll say, well, what about that person that, that grew up in Thailand or in, in China and in, in Japan or Russia or the Middle East and, and they never heard of, of Jesus or never heard of the gospel or anything like that? Well, first of all, I think that's uh, ludicrous, okay, because the, the idea that these, these civilized countries don't know of Jesus is, is, is ridiculous, okay? Especially Middle East, right? Middle East all know of Jesus. They just reject that he's God, right? They reject that he's the son of God. And then these other countries, they know of Jesus. They just kind of look at him as like a tacked on type of God or, you know, another religion, okay? And um, they'll say, well, you know, how are they going to believe, right? How are these people that didn't grow up with Christianity or grow up with the Bible, how are they going to believe? I'm like, I know, I know tons of people that have believed that were from Thailand and China and Japan and Russia and, you know, uh, the Middle East. I've won people from the Middle East that grew up Muslim, okay? And, you know, and all these different cultures and all that stuff. And uh, now will it be harder a lot of times for those people? Yeah, it'll be harder because they have to let go of tradition. They have to let go of what they, were, they grew up with, okay? So just because it's harder for them doesn't mean that that negates the fact that Jesus is the only way or that uh, there's only one gospel or that there's only one way to heaven, okay? And, uh, but in Romans chapter 10 here, this is the, the soul winner's chapter, if you will, that we go here all the time to win people to Christ, and rightfully so, it's a great passage for it. I mean, the, the beginning of the chapter talks about my, my prayer to God is that Israel might be saved. I mean, it, it's very clear. What, what are we talking about here? Salvation, you know, getting people saved, right? In verse 13, very familiar verse, but it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not heard, or I'm sorry, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So we see this clear progression when it comes to salvation that how are they going to hear without a preacher, right? And how are they going to preach except they be sent? And, you know, without the gospel, you know, what are they preaching? You know, like this whole progression, because they need to have the gospel, they need to be sent out with the gospel, and they need to preach the gospel, then the person needs to hear the gospel, and then they need to believe the gospel and put their trust in Christ by calling upon the name of the Lord. Meaning that, um, you know, the act of you trusting in God uh, by, you know, asking for salvation, right? And so... The idea here is that, hey, there's these things that have to happen. But notice what is said right after this. And this is a great verse in, um, in verse 16 here. It says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. Okay? So when it's talking about obeying the gospel, it's talking about believing the gospel, first of all. But also this is in Isaiah 53. This is what starts off Isaiah 53. You know, who hath, you know, who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed, right? That's the whole verse of Isaiah 53, 1. But notice what's said here. It says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, so how do you get, how do you hear? How, do you, how are you going to believe, right? By the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharp in any two-edged sword, right? And the idea of being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, okay? But notice what it says in this next verse here. This is where we're getting a quotation from Psalm 19, okay? In verse 18, but I say, have they not heard, okay? Who's they, right? It, it, who, the they are the people that, didn't believe the report, right? But it says this, Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Who, who are they? Well, it's the preachers, right? It's the preachers of the gospel. It says, th this is the question, you know, this is the question everybody says, well, well, what are people that haven't heard? 
Well, that's answered here. Have they not heard? Yes. The answer is yes, they've heard. Now, you could say and be like, well, what about this or that? Listen, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, yes, they have heard. Now, have, has every person heard a clear, uh, you know, clean presentation of the gospel that is by grace through faith? And you can't lose your salvation at all. No, that's why we go out soul winning all the time. And people are like, man, I've never seen that before. But those same people have heard of Jesus. Those same people have heard of the death, burial, and resurrection. And, you know, they're not, it's not in a corner, okay? It's just like the sun's not in a corner, the, the sun that's in the sky. The idea of the gospel is not in a corner, okay? Now it's been muddied and people put all these different things on it. They pervert it, but it, it's out there, okay? And, and the, so the, 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 the answer is yes, they've heard. They've heard, and it says, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. So he's likening his word being preached and the word in the gospel being put forth. And it says, and this is the word by, which by the gospel is preached unto you, it says in, in 1 Peter chapter 1. Okay? It's likening that. God is likening his word being preached around the world to the sun shining on the earth. Okay? Do you see that in Psalm 19 where it's talking about the sun being in his tabernacle, but then he comes out you know, strong? Meaning that each day the sun's rising, right? And so that's the equivalent to the word of God being preached. And so, you know, people can use anecdotal stuff all day long. They can use these hypotheticals about some guy on an island somewhere. I'm going to get to that, okay? Because I'm not saying that that couldn't happen, okay? But here's the thing, you know, if you know that guy on the island somewhere, why aren't you giving them the gospel? And it all comes down to this, too. If, theoretically, they're saying, well, you know, people that haven't heard, then they would go to heaven because, you know, they didn't get a chance or whatever, right? Well, then we're doing them a disservice by going to that island. We're doing them a disservice by preaching the gospel to people that haven't heard then, right? So what are we doing but just damning people to hell then? Now, what it comes down to, go to uh, John chapter 3, is that people are condemned already, okay? We're not, con listen, they've already been condemned by their sin. The law is condemning them, and so if they don't believe the gospel, they're, they've already condemned themselves, okay? You say, well, that doesn't seem fair, you know, God created us into this world, and he knew that we'd be condemned already. And listen, here's the thing. I'm going to get to the idea of God's love, love and mercy and his, his work to get us saved and get as many people saved as possible and that he wants everybody to be saved. But in the end, listen, if we died in our sins, we got what we deserved. And that's what people don't want to swallow. They don't want to swallow that if someone dies in their sins and they were living in uh, Buddhist China somewhere, that they didn't get what they deserved. Okay, God is just, okay? And obviously living in America, it's going to be a lot easier to hear the gospel or hear a clear presentation of the gospel, but at the same time, to whom much is given, much is required. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me that there's a lot of reprobates and people that God has turned over to a reprobate mind because they have the truth so readily available and they reject it, okay? And so... But anyway, in, in, in John chapter 3 and verse 18, it says this. It says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Notice that it's already. You're, al you're already condemned. Okay, so this isn't something where we come to the door and then we give them the gospel and then they reject it. And it's like, well, now you're condemned. Okay, and I've heard that argument before. Okay. Now, I preached a whole sermon about children. I'm going to get to that a little bit, you know, just the idea of, like, children and people that have mental disabilities to where they can't understand. That's different than someone that understands the difference between good and evil and rejecting the gospel. But here's the thing. They would have already been condemned, okay? But the idea that, that Jesus isn't known throughout the world, I mean, he was preached throughout the whole world when Paul was on the earth, Okay? And so it, it's, it's really ridiculous. And listen, I don't believe that that was the only time that, listen, every single country got to hear the gospel. And listen, it's still this way today that most all countries know of Jesus. They know the story, okay? It's not like they're just like, well, who's this Jesus character? Listen, every religion compares their religion to, to Christianity, right? Everybody's just like, well, my prophet's better than Jesus, or, you know, like, this is better than that, and every holy book compares itself to what? The Holy Bible, and not only the Holy Bible, but the King James Bible, right? 
Because when they compare it, they're like, well, it, it's even more magnificent than the King James. Or they're trying to say, well, it's just as good as the King James. Because they don't want to compare it to the NIV. Right? <laughs> but all the other versions are like, well, you know, it's better than the King James. You know, so, you know, the truth is going to come out. And it, isn't it interesting, too, that all these other people that are in other religions that are, let's say, in Hollywood or on TV and stuff like that, when they're using the Lord's name in vain, what do they say? They say our, our Savior's name, right? They're not like, oh, Allah, you know, oh, Muhammad, <laughs> right? You don't hear that, right? You hear a Muslim saying, you know, uh, our Savior's name in vain. You hear a Jew saying our Savior's name in vain. You hear every religion using our Savior's name in vain. You'll see a, you'll see a Hindu see, saying it, right? And so why? Because they know who the true God is, okay? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And, you know, the true God is very evident, okay? You have to push him out. You have to push the idea of the true God out in order to uh, believe the false idea, okay? Now, Romans chapter 5 here, Romans chapter 5, I just want to really just hone it in on this. If everybody in the world right now died in their sins, okay, that can understand the knowledge of good and evil, and let's say they didn't hear a clear presentation of the gospel, God would be just to send them all to hell, okay? Now, that's not what God wants, but he'd be just to do it, okay? And it's, you know, that's a hard pill to swallow, but you know what another hard pill to swallow is, is that many are going to hell and few are going to go to heaven. The majority of people are going to go to hell, okay? That's a hard pill to swallow. And this is something that's brought up to me a lot when I'm talking to unsee people. I'm trying to give them the gospel, and they just don't want to swallow that pill. They don't want to swallow the pill that the Bible teaches that many go in there at, to that, to that wide gate and to that broad way, okay? And few there be that find the narrow way and the straight gate. It, 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 it's just, they don't want to think about that. You know, are there few that be saved? And what did Jesus say? Few there be that find it. So it, it, it's a hard truth. I, I don't like that. I don't think Jesus likes that. But it's the truth, okay? So whether you like it or not, you need to just swallow what the truth is, okay? The truth isn't always fun. The truth isn't always going to be pleasant, okay? But in the end, do you want to put your head in the sand like an ostrich and just say, well, you know, I just, I just hope everybody's going to be safe that doesn't know or they're just ignorant, right? So, but, uh, but in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 here, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So it's basically saying that, listen, Adam sinned, which caused sin to come into the world, right? Death and sin, you know, all that stuff. But it says, and death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, okay? So it's not saying that we die because of Adam's sin, okay? But because of his sin, that's why we you know, we had that nature to sin, and therefore we, then we sinned, okay? So we're not going to be put to death because we didn't do the similitude of Adam's transgression, right? We're being put to death, or our bodies, or, you know, if you die in your sins, you're going to go to hell because of your own sin, okay? Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, okay? That's why we die, okay? That's why someone would go to hell, is because of sin, Okay? And obviously we know that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So if anybody thinks that they're not worthy of hell, you know, then tell me that you're not a liar. And if you tell me you're not a liar, I'm going to call you a liar. <laughs> okay, so that, that means that we all deserve that. That's just for us to go there. But what I want to get across to here is that, you know, there are naturalistic things that can bring you to God. Okay, not get you saved. Okay but get you on the path or the journey, okay? So if you're thinking about someone that's on an island somewhere, right? Or they're in a country where it's just not, it's not a Christian nation and it's not a nation where the gospel is just being propagated across it. Now, th nowadays it's hard to imagine that because of the internet, right? Because even if you're in, I mean, I know, I guess in China they like block this type of stuff, right? So they're not going to have my preaching maybe in China. Um, but let's say, you know, that case, right? You know, even in our day today, you know, there's a country where they're just blocking all that stuff from coming in um, as much as they can. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, 
it was obviously a great passage dealing with the gospel and believing, but it also gets into people that have rejected it and hold the truth and unrighteousness. Um, but it brings up a point of like of of things that would also make them without excuse. You know, besides the fact that they've heard the truth, they they they've been preached the gospel to, but also just the physical things of this world. How you have to reject that to to go away from God. Okay. Notice in verse 16 there, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So I want to make it very clear that salvation is by the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? Which is that he died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. That's how we're saved, and we're not saved by looking up at the moon, stars, and all that, okay? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, okay? So that's very clear. And notice even verse 17 that it's by a preacher, too, meaning that a saved person has to give you the gospel for you to get saved. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, okay? Not from the moon to you, okay? Not from the sun to you, okay? The, the idea why he's using that as an example is because it does show the glory of God, and it's showing the universality of uh, how the, the, the heavens and astronomy is viewed around the world, and you don't need to speak a certain language to understand it. Okay, mathematics, you know, all that stuff is very universal. Um, but those keep reading there because it's going to get into people that reject the truth, reject the gospel. In verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Okay, notice this in verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay? So even, you know, the creation, the invisible things, you know, and you think, well, what, what, what do you mean by invisible things? Well, I mean, you think of like when you look at an atom, and an atom is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and God is three in one, Right? And it says the eternal power and Godhead, right? The Godhead is, another way to say it is Godhood, right? Or the state of being God. Who's God? What's God's being? Well, it's three persons in one. God, right? And so uh, you can see in the universe and in uh, you know, nature and just how God built things, right? By the things that are made, right? You can kind of look at how God made things and understand the Trinity. You can understand, you know, even the human being is made up of soul, body, and spirit, right? So you can see that idea of this trinity throughout nature and even in, in hu human beings. And so what it's basically saying is that they're without excuse because, you know, they could even understand God's eternal power and Godhead by nature, okay? That doesn't mean that they got saved off that, okay? But they can understand it, they can grasp it. And I use this out soul winning all the time when I'm trying to explain the trinity, to be honest with you. And 99% of the time, people get it. You know, when I explain to them, well, the universe is made up of time, space, and matter. You know, they're different things, right? Time's not space, right? But you wouldn't have the universe if you didn't have one of those things in there, right? Just as much as the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are three different persons, right? But God is made up of those three different persons. You know, the one isn't the, the other person, right? The Father's not the Son, modalists. And the Holy Spirit's not the Father, right? So, but those three make up God. Okay, that's who God is. And, you know, the people are like, well, you're teaching partialism. Am I teaching partialism when you think about the universe being time, space, and matter? Is time a third of the universe? No. Okay? So, it's just the fact that time, but time isn't space and time isn't matter. Okay? So, the same thing applies with God. And so, you can use those type of things to teach people about or explain uh, the Trinity, the Godhead, right? But that alone is not going to get someone saved. But it's basically saying that, hey, you had the whole creation. You, the heavens declared the glory of God, and you rejected it. The firmament showeth his handiwork, and you rejected it. Okay? So if someone's on an island somewhere, and they're looking up into the sky, and they see the heavens, and they, understand, and they see all these different things that are going on, and they understand uh, you know, you know, the creation and all that stuff, and they see that, they have to reject all of that in order to reject God in general. And, and I'm going to get into some other things, too, because, you know, the idea, and I'm going to get into the idea of, like, what about that person? How does that person get saved, right? 
how does God deal with someone that would be on an island somewhere or something like that? I, don't, I do not believe, even in, let's say, the Mayan culture back in the day or some wicked culture back in some other time, that people are born with 0% chance of getting saved. Okay? I don't believe that. Do I, though I do believe that people have a lot lower chance. Okay? But I believe this, that if, if someone is searching out God and they want to know who God is and they want to know the truth, God will give it to them. Okay? You say, well, well, if we don't go, then no one's going to hear it. That's an impossibility. Okay? Obviously, you know, if we don't go, then less people are going to go. Okay? But the idea that everybody's going to stop soul winning is an impossibility. Okay? God will not let that happen. And it, and it never has happened, because if it did, we wouldn't be saved right now, because the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Okay, so something, some of these hypotheticals, you just need to throw in the trash, because they're non-existent. Okay, I'm tired of these hypotheticals. It's like, well, if, if you believed and you committed homosexuality, would you still be saved? It's an impossibility. Okay, it, or, you know, what if you got saved and you became a pedophile? Impossibility, can't happen. What if you got saved and then you became a God-hating atheist? It's an impossibility. It's a stupid hypothetical. Stop saying it, right? So people bring up these hypotheticals that are just, it's kind of like the, the paradoxical, you know, if God is all-powerful, can he create a rock that's so heavy he can't move? It's a stupid question, right? No, he's not going to create a rock that he can't move because that would negate the fact of him being all-powerful, right? So it's just stupid, right? It's, a, it's like, uh, you ever see those paradoxical things where you look at a stair case and it kind of looks like it's going up and down, up and down, up and down? Well, it's, it's paradoxical because you're not seeing it in, in like the actual right angle. And if you looked at it at the right angle, you'd notice that once you got to the top, you'd fall off. But you're looking at it at a view that looks like it's a paradox, but it's really not possible in reality, okay? And that's what people do with these, these hypotheticals. They put up these hypotheticals, but they're not based in reality, right? So it's not based on math or science either, right? So uh, they, they're just trying to give you a stumbling block to somehow try to answer it. But um, go to Romans chapter 2, because I want to uh, make a point here that, that people are born with the law written in their hearts, okay? So not only do they have... You know, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. You know, they have that, and they have, you know, the fact that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, right? Even his eternal power and Godhead. They can look at that stuff and understand, hey, there's a God, and not only is there a God, but it's a triune God, right? You say, well, how did Nebuchadnezzar, because people will use that and they'll say, well, you know, when he says the son of God, he really meant the son of, a, you know, a son of the gods, right? No, Nebuchadnezzar understood that the true God is a triune God and that it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, okay? And, or else why would he say, you know, the fourth in there is like the son of God, you know? Uh, well, God was speaking through him. Okay, you know, y y you're really going off the deep end to try to say something like that, okay? But it really comes down to this, they know who the true God is, and you'll see other places in the Bible, too, where they'll, they'll basically talk about God, and they know who that is, okay? So, they, and they're polytheistic, they believe in all these other gods, but they're like, no, your God is the true God, and they'll even talk about God, knowing that that's, that's who it is. They're just fooling themselves, right? The fool has said in the, their, their heart, there is no God, right? And so, people that are polytheistic, they're fooling themselves, right? They are literally putting the wool over their own eyes, basically saying, I don't want to believe the truth, I just want to believe this right here, okay? Now, in Romans chapter 2 and verse 14, notice what it says, it says, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. So notice it's basically saying that they don't have the physical law, right? They're not like dealing with the Ten Commandments and the law of Moses, that's what he's, he's, he's talking about here. But notice in verse 15, it says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Okay? So you know that the, the idea of murder is an innate law that's in your conscience, right? You don't have to be taught that it's wrong to murder somebody. Okay? My children know that. Okay? 
they'll watch like a cartoon where something dies or someone, you know, like you, you think of like these cartoons where something, someone murders somebody, like a, like a Disney movie or something like that, uh, or something, you know, along those lines. And they're, they know that's wrong, right? You don't have to teach them that. They just know that it's wrong to hurt people. It's wrong to, uh, to you know, to lie. You know, they do it, okay? But all that to say is that that's written in your heart, you know, your conscience, okay? So, you know, these countries, you know, they're like, what about this person over here? They think that murder's right. No, they don't. They've literally gone against the laws of nature, okay? Meaning the laws of nature in your heart. And this is why, you know, apologetics is a farce in a lot of these cases because people will say this and be like, well, you know, atheists, you know, why, you know, if you don't, if you don't believe in the Bible, then, then, then you have no way of knowing what's right and wrong. That's actually not a true statement. Okay. And that's why atheists will be like, well, I know it's wrong to murder. Okay. Now they don't have an ultimate authority, but their conscience, right? So in the end, they're kind of making themselves God, right? But the argument would be, well, what about the person that doesn't have a conscience? And then they say, no, it's right to murder, okay? So you can't base it off of individual people, you know, whether, you know, someone's conscience says this or that. But the idea that, you know, that they don't have any morality or uh, moral compass is a fault. It's not right, okay? This goes into that total depravity thing where uh, the, the Calvinists want to say, well, you know, people before they get saved, totally depraved, they can't do anything right. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous, to say that an unsaved person doesn't want to do anything right, they just, I mean, to say that, you would have to say that every commandment, they're just literally wanting to break that at all times, right? You're just wanting to murder people, you're wanting to, like, do violence to people, you're wanting to shed innocent blood. Like, what? No, people don't think that way, okay? And when you say stuff like that, you sound dumb, okay? And they're going to be like, no, that's not right, because I know that I don't think that way. And what you're doing by saying, well, the Bible teaches that, an unsafe person doesn't want to do anything right and they won't follow any type of moral compass. By saying that, you're negating Romans chapter 2. So, on top of that, and on top of just not being logical, you're not being biblical. Okay? So, that being said, you know, unsafe people that are on an island somewhere, that unsafe person, they not only have the sun, moon, and stars, the firmament, everything that's in it to help them understand God's eternal power and Godhead and creation itself. But they also have this, this innate conscience that has the law of God written in their hearts, right? Meaning they know like the basic principles of thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, right? Those type of things. Go to Romans chapter 7 because the one thing I do want to point out is that, you know, when you're in these cultures, and I preached a whole sermon on this dealing with, you know, where the children go when they die, that... And this comes up, I think, in tandem a lot of times. Well, like, what about children? What about, you know, people that are mentally handicapped? Stuff like that, right? And so it's a good question, right? It's a good thing that, that I, I understand why they're asking it. So, but this usually goes in tandem about children. And the thing is with children is that children are dead physically in trespasses and sins, like their body. That's why a child could die in the womb. That's why a child can die at a very young age. Um, but their soul is not dead. Okay, their soul is alive. Okay, this is what I believe about it, is that their soul is alive, okay? And I believe it comes into this innocency thing, meaning that their soul is innocent, it doesn't know. Okay, it doesn't know the knowledge of good and evil, though the body is committing sins, okay? But it's kind of like when we're saved, right? Our, our soul is perfect, sinless, but it says it's no longer I to do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, right? It's not that we're bipolar, okay? It's just the fact that it's the, it's the body that's doing it, not the spirit, not the soul. Now, in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Okay? Now, I don't believe necessarily that someone has to have the physical law shown to them for them to have the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Like I said, you kind of have that law in your hearts, that conscience, that when you can come to that realization before you even someone were to quote off to you, thou shalt not covet. So, but notice that he's basically saying that the law is kind of, that's what showed him, you know, that he had sinned against God, okay? And that's where I believe it is, is when you realize you've sinned against God, okay? Because my children can know that they've sinned against me, if you will, right? They transgressed what daddy or mommy said, right? But they don't understand 
you know, that I sinned against God, the creator of the universe, right? They don't comprehend that, okay? So that's kind of the difference there between the knowledge of good and evil. But notice what it says in verse 8 there. It says, but sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead, okay? Notice in verse 9, for I was alive without the law once. So Paul is saying here that I was alive without the law once. So this idea of being born where you're just dead spiritually, dead um, physically, kind of like this original sin, if you will, okay? So that blanket original sin, and some people are like, original sin's a, a hoax, you know, it's, it's not there. It is physically, okay, but not spiritually. So you have the people that completely negate original sin all the, across the board, and then you have people that say it's all across the board on the other direction. Does that make sense? When it's really the fact that your body is dead and trespasses and your flesh, but your soul is alive once, right? So Paul is basically saying, hey, I was alive once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Okay, so that, that means that there's a moment when he died spiritually. Okay, and the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Okay, so it doesn't tell us when this happened, right? And I preached a whole sermon. This isn't a sermon about that um, as far as like when that could happen. I believe that after 20 years old, like if you're mentally capable of understanding things, that you know, there's no, there's no hope after that as you not knowing, <laughs> okay? Meaning that, uh, and th my reasoning be behind that is in Deuteronomy thir uh, 139, where it's talking about the children of Israel going into the promised land and the people that would go were, were under 20, right? It was, it was all the children that were under 20. And it says this in, in Deuteronomy 139, it says, Moreover, your little ones, which ye, ha ye said should be a prey, your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. Now, in that, there could be people that died in the wilderness that were under 20 that had the knowledge of good and evil. Does that make sense? Okay. So, but that's kind of the, I believe, the cutoff point to where you're not going to be innocent unless you have a mental disability. Okay. So if you're a 40-year-old man and you just can't mentally, you're just mentally handicapped, and you can't understand the knowledge of good and evil, you can't understand the gospel, well, obviously that person's innocent spiritually. Okay. So, so that being out of the way of dealing with people that don't understand the knowledge of good and evil, that person that's on an island somewhere that understands the knowledge of good and evil, they need to get saved or they're going to die and go to hell. Okay? So, um, and one thing I want to get across here is that, let's say that person on the island, go to Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8. Let's say that person on an island and I'm using this as an example because isn't that the one that everybody gives you? Like, what about the guy on the island that's by himself? He's like, you know, it's like, well, how in the world did he get there? There's no one else there. Like, like you're, it's such an extreme hypothetical. Well, let's just use it for sake of argument. Let's say there's this guy that somehow got, like a child got stranded on there and was raised by wolves and then he like, you know, <laughs> was living on this island, right? Okay, let's use this crazy hypothetical, okay? Well, first of all, he can look up into the sky and know that there's a God, right? He can see the creation, know there's a God. He has an innate conscience that tells him that murder is wrong, all this other stuff's wrong, okay? But I believe that if he searches for God, God will either get him off that island or he'll send someone to the island, okay? And I'm going to prove that to you. I'm going to show you that. But notice what Jesus says here. And this is, has to do a lot with the parables. He spoke to some people in parables, some in not. And the idea of, uh, those that have and those that have not, uh, dealing with the spiritual aspect here. Verse uh, 18, so Luke 18 and verse 18, notice what it says. It says, Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. Okay? So he's basically saying, Take heed how ye hear. Okay? And, you know, um, meaning this is that if you're receiving it, okay, if you're receiving it, he that hath shall be given, meaning that you're receiving what's being said, you have it, you understand it, you're receiving it, you want to know it, he's going to give you more. And you say, well, okay, that's not super clear. We'll go to Mark chapter 4, dealing with the same uh, passage, you know, it's the parallel passage of the sower and the seeds and all that, Mark 13, I'm sorry, Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8, it's all parallel passages there. But notice what it says here in Mark 4 and verse 24, because it says, take heed how ye hear, and notice that he's going to say, take heed what ye hear. Okay? So, you know, it's not only how you, it's not only what you hear, because obviously you want to hear the truth, right? You're hearing the truth, 
but it's also how you hear it, right? How are you receiving it, okay? Are you receiving it with an open mind, or are you rejecting it? Are you hardening yourself to it, right? Notice in verse 24, and I believe this is uh, one of the strongest cases to really show you how God works with somebody that's not, not getting saved yet, but they're, they're getting more, and they're receiving it, and God's going to give them more until if they really want to know it, they'll know it. They'll figure it out, and, you know, they'll have that opportunity to get saved. And verse 24 there says, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. And just to give you, just to know that that's talking about that same concept, for he that hath, to him shall be given, and he that hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he hath. Okay? So it's kind of showing you a dichotomy of someone that, is receiving what they're hearing and the other person is not receiving it, right? And so the person that's not receiving it, that person's in danger of it being taken away, right? Because here's the thing, God had dealt to every man the measure of faith, every man, okay? And what I believe is that when it says, he that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath, meaning this is that if you don't receive what you're hearing, then it could be even taken away, even that which you have, right? And it, even in Luke, it says that which thou seemeth to have, right? Because you have the ability to believe, right? But some people, that's taken away. It says they cannot believe, right? And I'm getting ahead of myself because that's the next passage I'm going to show you. But notice that I just want you to really hone in on verse 24 of Mark 4. It says, take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, to you. Okay? So the idea of, you know, it says, well, judge not, that you be not judged. This principle is not just for that, right? The idea of measuring out things. So the, as much as you receive it, and as you're readily available to receive it, the more ready God's going to give you more. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Okay, meaning this is that if you receive it, and you're just like, I want more, I want more, I want more, God's going to give it to you that much more. Okay? So the guy on the island, right? He sees that there's like, there must be a God. There's, there's you know... I'm seeing this in the creation. I'm seeing it here. I want to know. And he's praying to God. He's praying to God, and he, he knows there's a God out there. And he's praying, saying, Lord, let me, you know, show me who you are. Show me what I need to do. God will give that person more. Okay? And go to John chapter 12. Because it said, you know, and, and, uh, and, and this goes along, too, with people that when you give them the gospel, if they're, if they're open to it, and let's say they don't get saved, but they're, they're just like, that sounds good. I just need to think about that. Listen, that person, I don't believe God's like, all right, you better get saved here soon. I'm taking that away. Okay? I think it's more so the fact that he's like, okay, you received that well. I'm going to give you more. I'm going to give you more because you received it well. Now, that person could start hardening themselves, and then he's like, all right, well, then I'm not going to give you as much. Because as much as you would receive, the more that God's going to give you, but the much that you won't receive, the more that God's not going to give you. Okay, so that principle of, you, you've probably heard this principle of like the light that God has given you, if you receive that, he'll give you more light. That's the principle I'm talking about here, okay, where Mark is more so talking about what you hear, which is the same principle, right, the light of the word of God, the light of knowledge and truth and all that. But in, in John chapter 12, verse 36, notice what it says, and Jesus is talking here. It says, while ye have light, believe in the light that ye may be the children of God, or I'm sorry, the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. So notice that, why is he hiding himself from them? But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he, that, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. The reason I bring up that last portion right there is because that, in all those passages, you know, I, I believe, at least in Mark and Luke, that passage of Isaiah is brought up when he says, He that hath shall be given, and he that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. That's in context with what he's talking about. So when it says, while you had the light, believe in the light, that's the same as, you know, unto you that hear shall more be given. And you know, the, the idea of he that hath shall be given more, right? So if you receive that light, then God will give you more light. If you reject that light, 
He might just hide himself from you to where you can't find him anymore. Okay? And, you know, because we're not Calvinists, okay? We don't believe God's forcing people to get saved, okay? Because the Calvinists out there be like, well, if that person's elect on the island, then he'll get saved, you know? Like, it's like, no. You know, obviously, we, that person has to choose whether they want to receive it or not, okay? And if that person chooses not to receive it, so this is the thing. If someone dies and goes to hell in some one of these dark countries or dark country, uh, when, uh, you know, island somewhere, it's because they ultimately chose not to receive the light. Okay? And you say, well, it was such smaller light than what most people get. Yes. Okay? That's why we want to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, right? We don't, we, don't, we don't want it to be that case where this guy's been raised by wolves and living on an island somewhere and he doesn't have a chance to hear anything else, even though that's probably not happening most all the time. Okay? But all that to say is that that person, I still believe, has a chance because I don't believe God has, has uh, brought anybody into the world that has 0% chance. Now, the, to kind of prove that, if God, if God wants everybody to get saved, okay, because I'm not a Calvinist, when it says he wants all people to get saved, I believe that's every single person, not just the elect, okay? And uh, go to 2 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> I just want to touch on that real quick because... You've got to re- reconcile these things. If, if a lot of people are going to hell, most people are going to hell, and a lot of countries are not Christian countries. I mean, think about it. Before the, before the New Testament, where was, where was the true gospel? In Jerusalem, right? In Israel. And the rest of the world was dark. Right? But does that mean that no one got saved outside of that? What about the wise men? Right? The wise men that came from the east. By the way, that was in the Old Testament because Jesus hadn't died yet, they came from the east, and they saw the star. Why? Because they wanted to know the truth. I believe the wise men are in heaven right now. Okay? And they were seeking the king of the Jews. And what, you know, God even used a, a miraculous event of a star that they're following over to the Savior to get them saved. Okay? I don't believe the star got them saved, but I believe it led them to the Savior. Okay? So if you want to know how that, that man on the island is going to get saved... Well, maybe the stars, maybe God will do some miraculous thing. Because I don't believe that it's impossible for God to do some miraculous thing to lead someone into getting the gospel, okay? My child's rolling through the aisle right now, so. <laughs> Sorry, that was just, too, I, can't, I can't handle it, it's too funny. Uh, but, uh, so, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, I want you to see here that, uh, that God wants everybody to get saved. Okay, so in verse 9 it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay, so yes, most people are going to go to hell, but that's not because that was God's will. Okay, most people are going to hell because they rejected the light that was given to them. And a lot of people just rejected straight out a clear presentation of the gospel. People in America don't have an excuse, by the way. You have zero excuse if you're in America to not get the gospel. Okay, it's re- it, it'd be ridiculous. There's a, there's a church in every state at least, but if not multiple churches in every state that preach the right gospel. They may not be our stripe. They may believe in the pre-trib rapture. They may worship the Jews, but they still have the right gospel when it comes to salvation by grace through faith, and that is eternal security. And so, if you're in America. Zero excuse. Don't use this man on an island raised by wolves argument, okay? The idea of that goes into maybe other countries. But listen, those other countries used to be Christian nations. I mean, you think of uh, the UK, right? Britain. That's where we got the King James Bible from. So the idea that, you know, like, well, it's just America. No, no. England used to be the lighthouse to the gospel. Guess what? Turkey used to be the lighthouse to the gospel, right? That's where the seven churches of Asia, that's what it's talking about, is modern-day Turkey. That's where the letter of Revelation was written to, is to those seven churches. So I believe that was where, you know, the hub was at, if you will. Antioch was kind of the hub in Syria, but then it kind of moved over into Turkey, and Greece also was in there, as far as the churches of, you know, Corinth and Thessalonica and, like, these different places. So it's been moving, right? I think that the... uh, the Mon- uh, Mongolian Empire, at one point, there was a Christian leader. He got saved, and he ended up being uh, basically a Christian country for a little bit. So you say, well, that country never believed in the gospel. They never followed true God. Yeah, that's not true. 
you know, study your history. But here's the thing. Our country, if the Lord tarries, could turn into an antichrist, you know, God-hating country. But guess what? It's going to, another country's going to pick up the torch then. You know, someone's going to pick up the torch as far as leading the charge with the gospel, okay? So that's not a good argument to say, well, you know, this country's kind of, uh, no, no, they're getting judgment for that, and more people are going to hell because of that, but it's not because they didn't have any opportunity and all that. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, it says this, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who, uh, ha who will have all men to be saved and, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And so there's no other way, okay? The idea is that he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And the thing that, I keep, that keeps being brought up is that, well, you know, that works for us that grew up with it, but what about, you know, the rest of the world, they should be given a pass. No, he died for the sins of the whole world, and there's no other mediator between God and men. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus said. There's no other way. And I have some other verses, you know, it talks about, for the grace of God that bringing salvation hath appeared to all men. It says in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, Luke chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. There's so many verses that I could go into this as far as the idea that it was for everybody. The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And unless you're a Calvinist and you want to change, uh, you know, that all to be, mean just all the elect, that means everybody. He tasted death for every man. That means that that's the way of salvation. That's how you get saved. The, neither is there salvation uh, uh, in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other way, okay? And to say otherwise, you just have to reject the Bible, okay? So unsaved people, you know, that, that, that are looking at this and be like, well, there has to be another way. There has to be other ways to get to heaven or to get to God. You, then you don't believe in the same God, right? Then you're saying that Jesus lied when he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's no way to get around that. And that's not the only place that it says that he's the only way, okay? Uh, how about this verse? Go to Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45. Because even in the Old Testament, guess what? It's the same way. And you're dealing with, because a lot of the argument is like, well, what about these people that believe in all these multiple gods or polytheistic? Listen, there's always been people that are polytheistic, you know? It's, it's something that, I don't know what it is, but just human nature wants to believe that there's multiple gods and and I, I think it's probably this because there's multiple devils, right? So because there's multiple devils, you know, the devil is trying to get people to, to believe in this polytheistic type of uh, religion, right? But in Isaiah 45, verse 20, it says this. It says, Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto God, to a God, unto a God that cannot save. So what does God say about these other graven images? And you think of the Hindus, you think of Buddhism, you think of all these different things where people are worshiping idols. What, is, what does God say? They're praying unto a God that cannot save. So he's not just talking about, well, I'm just talking to you, Israel. Who's he talking to? He's talking about those that are escaped out of the nations. He's talking to the Gentiles. He's talking to the heathen, right? Verse 21, tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. So listen, Genesis Revelation, there's only one Savior, there's only one God, and he's the only way that you're going to get saved. Notice in verse 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. You know, when we're talking about Christianity, this is not a cultural religion. This is worldwide, all across the world, all across the earth, that everybody has to believe this or they're going to hell. Okay? And a lot of religions, you know, will excuse people that don't believe in their religion and say, well, yeah, you know, as long as they're a good person. You know, Muslims will say that. Uh, Mormons will say that. Uh, a lot of different religions. I'm sure Hindus will say that, you know, and they're not condemning us to hell. Right? But 
the true God is, is just by him. That's why it's narrow. That's why it's straight. Straight meaning narrow, okay? Like the straits of Gibraltar. And so it's very clear that, you know, he wanted all, all the ends of the earth to be saved, even before the New Testament, okay? Now, I'm going to give you this, this last thing I'm going to show you, but I'm going to give you an example of a man, you know, if you want to, he's not on a desert island, so sorry. I didn't find the guy on the desert island, raised by wolves. But in Acts chapter 10, I'm going to show you about Cornelius, okay? Now, Cornelius was a Roman. Romans believed it were polytheistic, okay? They basically, the Romans basically took the Greek uh, gods and made them their own, okay? So, you know, I think Artemis and Di uh, Diana are the same goddess, okay? But Diana is like the, you know when it says we, the worshiping the great goddess Diana, right? Well, that's the Roman equivalent, right? It's just the name that the Romans gave it, but Artemis is like the, uh, I think it's Artemis. I could be messing that up, okay? But, uh, but anyway, at least, if anything, there's another name that they used for the Greek goddess, okay? So they basically just swapped names and changed some different things about their, their mythology. Um, but all that to say is that Romans did not believe in one god, meaning by large, you know, their, their, uh, their empire did not believe that. And notice Cornelius here in verse 1. It says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the, the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So you say, well, you know, if, if that person's on a desert island, he's not going to know who God is. He's not going to be able to pray to him. Yeah, you think that. That's not true, though. Okay, you made up a hypothetical that's not true. Do you know that atheists pray to God and talk to God? Right? And unless you're completely mentally unstable or you can't comprehend God, you know he's there. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. You know what that means is he's telling himself, there's no God, there's no God, there's no God. <laughs> right? But in the end, they even know that there's a God. Okay? I think it was, um, not Carl Sagan, who's uh, Richard Dawkins, was even on camera talking about the universe and he even just slipped up and said that there might be a designer. I mean, he is the prophet of atheism and, you know, basically negating God and basically saying God doesn't exist, right? I can't, I think it's either him or Bill Maher that wrote the God delusion or something like that. Um, but these atheists, I mean, they, they're, they're out there to propagate their atheism. But it's just funny because it's just like he even slipped up. He's like, yeah, you know, that would probably prove that there's a designer, you know, or an all-powerful being out there or whatever. Uh, because they have to fool themselves. They have to trick themselves and be like, no, there's no God. No, 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 no. And so it's not a natural thing to say there's no God, okay? So the idea of someone being on an island somewhere praying to God and fearing God, right? That's something that would be a natural thing to come across there, meaning that, you understand that you're gonna, you could die. You can, under, you can understand the eternal power in Godhead by the creation. Okay? So, um, putting all those things together, listen, um, you know, he, he was just seeking after God. It didn't say he was seeking after Jesus, right? But notice what it says here in verse 3. It says, He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Okay, so first of all, I want you to see that the angel didn't give him the gospel. Okay. So these people are like, oh, I saw a vision, I saw an angel talk to me, and, they, they, and that's how I got saved. No. You know, it's revealed from faith to faith. Unless it's the Lord Jesus Christ showing himself, which Paul said he's the last to see Jesus, so that's out the window, right? Then no, they're not getting you saved, okay? Uh, but all that to say is that, you know, what did, what did uh, God do? He sent him an angel to tell him what to do, right? And he's not done yet, right? What if he saw this and didn't send for Peter? Then he wasn't going to get saved, right? So do you see how, you know, how he hears it, how he receives it? 
and how he takes that afterward will reflect on whether he's going to get saved, okay? Then, you know, in, in, in Acts chapter 11, it's very explicit that when he was saying to send for him to tell us what thou ought to do, it was talking about so that he could be saved. In Acts chapter 11, this is where Peter's recounting what happened. In verse 13, it says, And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Okay? So when he's saying, you know, he'll going to tell you what thou oughtest to do, well, I mean, that's true because I'm sure he's going to tell you how to get saved. He's going to tell you you need to get baptized. He's going to tell you all the things that you need to do. But ultimately, what was the main goal there? So that Peter would go there and preach him the gospel. And in Acts chapter 10, verse 44, that's where you see it, him, him and his household getting saved. Because it says, while Peter, in verse 44, so Acts 10, verse 44, it says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, meaning that um, they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. It wasn't just the, that they received the Holy Ghost, but they got the power and the baptism of the Holy Ghost because they started speaking with, with new tongues, meaning they could speak other languages and all these different things that were going on at that time. So Cornelius is a great example of this. Is someone that was, you know, they, he knew there was a God out there, he was praying to God, and God heard him, okay? So people that are out in these other countries, they're praying to God, and they're not saying the name of Jesus, but they're praying. They were like, I want to know you, God. They're gonna, God's going to hear that prayer, okay? And if they really want to know, God will send them, you know, someone to hear the gospel. Or they'll send them to that person, right? Some way, they're going to hear the gospel, Okay, if they keep receiving it, and it may not be just a two-step plan. It may be just like, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this. Will you receive it? And then they receive more of that. And he's like, all right, I'll give you this. Will you receive it? And then they receive more of that. And then, and then it's just this, and it builds, 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 builds. But here's the thing. That, that means that that person has an opportunity. It may be harder. It's a, it's a harder ladder to climb, if you will, to get to the truth. But at the same time, you know, they have an opportunity. I believe every single person that goes to hell... Every person that will be in hell could have gotten saved. Just there, there, there was a chance. You know, it may not have been as much of a chance as others, but if they had a chance, there's no one in hell that had 0% chance of going to heaven. Okay? And also this too, and this is why we go out soul winning and why we preach the gospel, because we want to make that chance better. Does that make sense? Right? I believe everybody will have a chance. God will make sure everybody has a chance to hear the gospel. Right? Because let's say there was just one church that was preaching the gospel, hypothetically, which is ridiculous, but let's say that was true, right? Then God's going to make sure that everybody hears that message, that wants to hear it. Does that make sense? In, in supernatural ways, whatever it's going to happen, whatever it takes, he's going to make sure that people are hearing that message from that one messenger or those, those few messengers that are there. But you're talking about a, a ridiculous hypothetical there, but I do believe that he's working that way. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I just want to kind of end with this here. Because, yes, I do believe that everybody can have a chance. But, you know what's better than that? You know, as far as going through this whole, like, hard process for them to climb this tree to, to the truth? Why don't we just take it to them? Does that make sense? Let's just take it to them. Let's just take it straight to them and give them that opportunity to hear it. And then at that point, there's, no, there's, like, there's nothing that they can say like, well, I didn't have a good enough opportunity, okay? I believe everybody does, and I believe if anything, if someone really wants to know, they'll be like a Cornelius. But wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it have been a lot easier if someone just knocked on Cornelius' door, right? Where they, they saw him on the street somewhere and said, hey, you know, do you know 100% sure you're going to have him? be like, no, man, but I've been wanting to know, and I've been praying about it, and you know, so that's what our job is, is let's make it more accessible. Let's make it, uh, you know, easier, not harder, you know. Let's make God's job easier, right? Let's make God's job easier so that he doesn't have to do, like, send an angel over here and then pull someone over there to go, go get them saved, right? Do we want people to be, do, you, do, you, do we really want God to send people into West Virginia to get people saved? Or why don't we just do it ourselves while we're here, right? We're, we're here. Let's do it here. You know, um, and the same thing would apply in other countries, right? 
Let's get people saved that live in those countries. Let's get them on fire for God, and then they're there, and they can win people to Christ, and that's how it's going to get done, okay? Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 5, it says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed? Again, this idea of uh, the, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, and how shall they hear without a preacher, right? Ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. Now, if someone doesn't receive the light, then he's not going to maybe hear that man that was prepared for him. Does that make sense? Right? If Cornelius wasn't fearing God and praying to him and all this stuff, then he wouldn't have sent the angel. And if he, didn't, if he didn't call for Peter, then Peter wouldn't have come. But Peter was the man prepared, right? He was the, man, the minister by whom Cornelius and his family got saved, right? But do you see how if he didn't receive that, if he didn't receive the light and believe in the light that was given to him as he was going on, that that minister wouldn't have made it to him, okay? But, like I said, let's make it easier. Let's make it, let's make it, a, let's bring up that chance from 0.001% for these people that are like in these dark places. Let's increase that to like 25%, right? So, it's not that, uh, you know, everybody's going to hear a clear presentation of the gospel, but I'll say this, everybody could if they really wanted to. That's my point. If they really wanted to, if they searched after God and received the light that he was giving them, they will hear a clear presentation of the gospel and given an opportunity to believe on it. Okay. And lastly, I'll leave this dealing with the idea of soul winning. Uh, Jude verse 22, it says, and if some have compassion, making a difference and others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And, uh, you know, and I think about that man that's on the island that's raised by wolves, you know. If that guy exists, I want to give him the gospel, okay? <laughs> so the idea, though, that, well, you know, that person's going to be excused, well, then why would I want to go give him the gospel? Just let him stay there, you know. Uh, let Mowgli live with his wolves and, you know, he'll go to heaven when he dies. No, but, but honestly, that's not practical. It's not what the Bible teaches and I just want to get on that subject as far as, have they not heard? Because that's always what I hear. It's like, well, what about people that didn't hear? Well, Jesus, what did the Bible say? Yes, they've heard. So that's the answer. That's the answer of God. Have they, have they heard? Yes, they have. But let's make it more accessible. Let's make it clearer. Let's, let's give them more opportunities. Let's give them more than one opportunity. You know, why not? Let's preach them the gospel until they don't want it anymore. Okay? But let's end with a word of prayer today. Father, we thank you for today. And I just pray that you be with all of our church family, um, and most of them being at home right now. And Lord, just pray that you would uh, help us to, to, to have a, a heart to win souls and to, to reach those people that are in dark places if, we, if, if we're given the opportunity there. Um, but also I pray that you would be with those that want to know the truth. I pray that you'd be merciful to them and help them to, to, to get an opportunity there. And lead us to people that are wanting to hear it, like these Corneliuses and and different people that are just wanting to know the truth, Lord. I just pray that you would um, lead us to those people. And then, uh, and Lord, I do pray that, that our church could get back to normal services here soon so we could have fellowship and, uh, and, and enjoy each other's company. And, Lord, uh, just pray that you'd be with the families and any hardships that they may be going through. I just pray that you'd be with them in that. And, Lord, we love you. I pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.